hope everybody can see that and can hear me okay. That all right, Maria? Yeah. Excellent, okay. So thank you for that introduction. Um, as Maria explained my, my different roles, our biggest focus really is as uh, a local, local Christian groups to try and increase awareness of the amazing Christian heritage that our region has had and continues to have. And a key important part of that are, are the Quakers. Uh, and the Quakers is just one of a whole stream of people, uh, really from, from Thomas Cranmer to early Puritans to the Mayflower, which we're hearing a lot about this week, um, the Wesleys and, and William Booth amongst others. So amazing heritage. But today we're going to focus on the Mansfield angle of the Quakers and particularly uh, their early relationships with America over the question of, of religious liberty. So as I'm, as I'm sure you all know, um, although George Fox is often described as a Leicestershire man because that's where he was born, uh, the pivotal part of his life really happened in, in Mansfield. And it's one of the shames of our local heritage that the house that he lived in while he was in Mansfield uh, has been demolished, although it fortunately it survived long enough to be quite a nice picture of it. Uh, and I'm sure he would not have approved the fact that it's demolished and replaced by a Catholic church, which he would have had arguments with about on a number of things. So that's one of the ironies of history, maybe. But Fox, as a young man, uh, ended up in, in Mansfield. He was an itinerant shoemaker, and it was one of the places that he got to know on his journeys. Um, and, but he was always on a spiritual journey. Ever since he was a very young man, he'd been looking for a, a better form of Christianity, and he'd engaged with many people over the years. But it was in Mansfield, really, that his pivotal moment came. When walking past the church, he heard a voice speaking to him saying, there is one, even Jesus Christ, that can speak to thy condition. Uh, and that really helped to change his life. And he can, found in our area a number of other groups who were similarly seeking a better form of Christianity. Often they were called seekers because they were, were saying that they hadn't actually found what they were looking for. Uh, but Fox decided that maybe he had found that. And so he found a group of ready, uh, ready fellow travellers to engage with. And the really dominant idea that Fox came up with was that he believed that God could speak directly to each person, uh, that each individual Christian could continue to have revelation from God um, the Holy Spirit could speak through them uh, and the supernatural was was possible. And that put him at odds with a lot of the Puritans who were uh, particularly resistant to any uh, new revelation, uh, who had a very uh, rigid view that the Bible was sufficient and that there would be no other form of revelation. So there was a, a collision cause was inevitable that we can see from this. So as I said, he, he found a, a group in North Nottinghamshire and South Yorkshire of people who he could instantly relate to. So very quickly, Fox started to develop a number of groups around the area. Uh, in Mansfield, in Skegby, which was mentioned in the, in the earlier talk, um, and at places just south of Doncaster, particularly Bowlby, uh, south of Doncaster. And these were secret congregations, but he also found some interest amongst Baptists and particularly general Baptists who had a similar theology to him but were not particularly well organized. So there was some fertile ground for the early Quakers. And of course it was not an easy start. Um, and that some of you who live in Mansfield would know, Mansfield Woodhouse is particularly famous uh, for a place where there would be, um, there would be problems for, for the Quakers. Uh, and there was an occasion when Fox was put in the stocks at Mansfield Woodhouse and other uh, later Quaker ladies were uh, abused and persecuted, not entirely without good cause, it must be said, because one of the traits of the early Quakers was going into what they called steeple houses, 
and disrupting the sermon by asking questions and refusing to take their hats off. So it's quite a lot of, of trouble in the early days, which was almost deliberately confrontational. Now, um, that sort of confrontation, of course, uh, brings us on to the question about what did the law say about religion? And in Fox's um, early days, he'd grown up under a situation really which was still Elizabethan in structure, where the Church of England held sway and where people had been expected to go to their own parish church and, and nowhere else. And it was a situation which had been enforced by law. Now, actually, the first people in England who really started to challenge this, who really started to argue that there should be no laws about religion, were the Baptists. And the first of those to actually say that laws of religion should be abolished for all Christian people was Thomas Helwes, who grew up uh, at Ascombe near Retford, had lived at um, uh, at Bro uh, in Broxtow, uh, uh, at Bilborough, and he wrote this letter to the king, which you can see on the left of my screen, uh, which accompanied uh, a pamphlet that he'd written, arguing that the king was a mortal man and had no control over the immortal souls of his, of his subjects. He wasn't challenging the king's political control, but he was saying there should be no laws on religion. And this, uh, fitted very well into George Fox's view of life. And on the right hand side of the screen, we have a, a quotation from, from Fox slightly later in life, in which he more or less exactly repeats the words of Thomas Helwes and Helwes's friend, John Merton of Gainsborough, in, in arguing that laws of religion should be abolished and very radically extending this to include non-Christian groups. And here you can see Fox saying, it doesn't matter whether you were June Papist or Turk, and actually going on to say, even people who worship the moon should be free to pursue their religion without government involvement. So there's a lot of overlap between the particular General Baptists and the Quakers to begin with, uh, and they all shared suspicion of people who held legal office, like magistrates, for example, were for good reason, as it, as it turns out. Now, the other uh, really important local Quaker, who, who also was mentioned earlier on, possibly one of his first converts, uh, was Elizabeth Hooton, who was a woman from originally from Ollerton, uh, who'd moved to Skegby. And one of the remarkable things is that her house in Skegby has survived, uh, having become for a time the first Quaker meeting house in, in the country. I'm not quite sure in the world, therefore, not quite sure how far its great historical importance is, is fully recognised. Um, but he started holding meetings at, at Skegby and they were fully involved in quite radical, supernatural type of faith that was very shocking to Puritan communities and, and more moderate Church of England as well. Plus the fact that he was quite happy with people like Elizabeth Hooton preaching. And the sight of a woman preaching would have been very, very controversial at that time. Now, fortunately, it's quite a lot of detail about those meetings has survived because Hooton's son described some of them uh, and actually how they were, uh, you know, claims that people were raised from the dead and all sorts of things went, went on, such that some were shocked and didn't come back, but others found the type of Christianity that they had been looking for. Another local uh, Quaker of, of great interest, particularly as we're thinking about persecution today, is James Parnell of, of Retford. And James Parnell, um, when he was still very young, about 15 years old, was so interested in, in the Quakers that he walked from Retford to Carlisle in order to visit George Fox in jail and then walked back again. And, I mean, that's a pretty full day's journey by car, he did it by foot in an age without any maps, as no more than a, than a teenager. 
And Parnell became then a successful Quaker preacher. He was so young, he was called the Quaking Boy. Uh, and he went off down into East Anglia to Cambridge, where he, he preached and was thrown out of the city, into Essex, where he established Quaker meetings in, in Chelmsford and in Colchester. But this is an example of how the law eventually trapped Quakers, because he was arrested uh, at the town of Coggeshall for disturbing the peace during a church service. And as a Quaker, he refused to conform with the law and therefore refused to pay the fine that was levied upon him. So he was put in Colchester Castle, uh, the, which was the prison in those days, where he was abused and starved and eventually died. And therefore he became the first Quaker to die for his beliefs. Now, it's a very great shame for our county that we have nothing to commemorate James Parnell in his hometown. Whereas if you go to Colchester, there's a memorial on the wall of the Quaker Meeting House, there's a memorial inside the castle, and there's even a road named after him. In his hometown, nothing. And this is just characteristic, it's why we felt we needed to form an organisation to promote awareness. So this was going on in, in England in the 1640s and 1650s. What was happening in America at the same time? And I'm, I'm sure you've all had your fill of Mayflower related uh, stuff recently and quite a bit of controversy about it as well. Um, but let's just stick to a few basic facts about it. Uh, we know that in 1620, the Mayflower pilgrims left from England uh, because they wanted to practice their own style of worship uh, for themselves. Particularly style of worship, the way they weren't particularly disagreeing about theology or basic beliefs. There was no sense that they were going to establish a, a, a colony of freedom of worship for everybody. They were going to establish a place for themselves. But they were reasonably tolerant in their initial approach. What then happened though, was that uh, 10 years or so later, a very large new migration began. And these were people who were leaving England because of the increasing pressures of Archbishop Lord and Charles I, and including very famous preachers like John Cotton. So these were quite ardent English Puritans of a different type to the original Mayflower pilgrims. And they also wanted to establish a life that uh, was in accordance with their own particular views and beliefs. And they were much less tolerant of anyone else. And this included even lack of tolerance within their own communities. Now we haven't got time to talk about in detail the antinomian controversy of 1636 to eight. But here was uh, a disagreement uh, which really actually touched on the issue of whether God could speak to people uh, outside of the Bible. So it would have been a familiar one for Fox. It was a controversy which absolutely tore uh, Massachusetts apart, uh, put John Cotton in a very, very difficult position uh, and particularly featured a very, very interesting woman called Anne Hutchinson, who we haven't got time to talk about today, and a man called Roger Williams, who you can see in this picture here, who was a preacher uh, who shared some of the new views and who also is notable for building up relationships with the Native Americans, one of the first of the colony to actively seek to take the gospel to them. And people like him were thrown out of Massachusetts uh, in the middle of the winter uh, at risk of their own death because they would not toe the line with the government of the colony. So you end up here then with a, a situation in America which was just as intolerant as the situation in England. And, and of course, the Quakers soon had ideas about going to America themselves. And you all already have, have seen that that's going to lead to, to trouble. Uh, 1656, the first Quakers got to America, uh, two women, interestingly in itself, who, who reached Boston, Massachusetts via Barbados. 
Uh, and of course, as you'll imagine from how the Massachusetts people had treated people like Roger Williams uh, earlier, uh, they were very intolerant of these new arrivals. Any Quaker books were burnt uh, and the two women were immediately deported back to Barbados. Now they've gone to Massachusetts. Had they gone to Ro Roger Williams's colony in Rhode Island, a few uh, couple hundred miles away, they could perhaps have had a more tolerant treatment because they got a very, very different approach. But Massachusetts was very intolerant. And as a result of this visit, really, in 1658, they decided to introduce capital punishment for people who broke their religious laws. Now, just to put that in perspective, the previous person to have been executed in, uh, in England for religious opinions was uh, a man in 1612, who was in fact the last person to be uh, judicially executed over a matter of religion. Doesn't include people like uh, Parnell who died in prison, but this was a this was a major step back in terms of introducing punishment uh, for beliefs, uh, particularly given the sort of freedom that people had had in England during the Civil War years. And and of course it then uh, ended in in one of the big crises crises for, for New England. And there's some uh, very interesting books that you can, you can read about uh, women like Mary Dyer, who, who got involved in this. So in 1659, uh, three Quakers in New England were, were arrested, two men uh, and a woman called, called Mary Dyer. They were taken to the gallows to be hung uh, for their uh, beliefs. Effectively. And although Mary Dyer was reprieved on that occasion, the two men weren't, uh, she then uh, returned back to, came back to Massachusetts not long afterwards, uh, and they arrested her again, and she was executed as a, as a repeat offender. That, uh, then, that policy then continued with the uh, following year, another man called William Ledra was executed for, for being a Quaker. But by this stage, and we need to remember that Massachusetts was still a colony of, of England uh, and operating under a charter from the government of England. And of course, the government of England had changed. So in 1661, the governor Endicott in Massachusetts was forced to accept actually that there'd been a change. Uh, Charles II sent a deputation to Massachusetts, which included some Quakers, uh, and Endicott had to abandon a plan to execute another Quaker. Uh, briefly, Charles II refused to apologize. That was not lost. The uh, Massachusetts people then realized uh, that their own legal position was, was uh, weak. Uh, they were forced from now on to send Quakers back to England for trial, and they were worried about losing their charter. Because by executing Quakers, they'd actually caused quite a shock in England. So Endicott, uh, in order to save his charter, sent one of the other leaders of the, of the community back to England, which was Simon Bradstreet. And Simon Bradstreet was a Lincolnshire man, very senior member in the colony, uh, one of the families who'd migrated over with, with John Cotton, so a very influential person. And then there's an amazing scene uh, where Bradstreet came back to England and George Fox, uh, who clearly knew that he was coming, met him on the quayside in uh, what I think nowadays would have been a a sort of staged photo opportunity of, of an event, you know, where you'd have told the BBC in advance to turn up because something interesting was going to happen. Uh, and Fox met Bradstreet on the quayside, accompanied by, by two men who lost their ears for being called And also with the man who said he was the father of William Robinson, who'd been executed. And Fox threatened to have Bradstreet arrested for murder, uh, because he was arguing that actually the Massachusetts colony had no right to execute anyone. The interesting sting in this, of course, is that George Fox himself 
would never have done such a thing because he didn't believe in using the courts. So it was a, it was a threat, something he might have done had he been a different man. But the impact on New England was considerable. They realized that their political position was, was dubious, but they still could not quite resist the desire to persecute the Quakers. And so they introduced a law which they called the cart and tail law. And it's a little bit like the cat and mouse law that was used against the suffragettes many years later. The cart and tail law really was about tying people to a cart, whipping them, and taking them out of the community to dump them in the wild. And that was introduced in 1661 instead of executing. So this is where we get back to our friend Elizabeth Houghton from, from Skegbit, because she'd already become uh, something of a traveling Quaker evangelist. And she joined the route to America. She'd actually been to America in 1657, and they'd done exactly uh, what they, they later did in the Carlton Tale Act, which was to drag her out of town and dump her off in the forest and hope that she would never come back. Now, Elizabeth Houghton always came back, so they, they were on the wrong track of this one. She actually came back to England and, and famously uh, harangued Charles II when he was out for a walk in, in St. James's Park about the persecution of the Quakers and, and what he should do about it, as well as his own sinful character. Uh, security wasn't quite so good in those days. A year later, Back she went to America and was a prominent victim of the Cart and Tail Act. So on several occasions, uh, she was stripped, whipped, uh, and dragged through town without, before being abandoned in the wilderness. In her own colorful accounts, she talks about being left to die amidst bears, wolves, and frozen water. Uh, on another occasion, she and another Quaker lady who, who was pregnant were dumped out in the in the wilderness uh, and they claim to have found their way back by following the tracks of wolves. So she was widely persecuted in America but also so in, in England. She was in and out of prison, particularly Lincoln prison, because uh, she moved across the border into Lincolnshire to, to Beckingham um, uh, a number of times she, she was in prison. Uh, the, the key moment though that's perhaps worth a note is that in March 1665 John Endicott died and Elizabeth Houghton attended his funeral and as you can probably guess that didn't turn out very well because she wasn't there exactly to mourn his passing. Uh, she finally died in, in 1672 uh, in Barbados so you know, you, we don't get many people from Nottinghamshire in the 1600s who died in Barbados that because it had, she's such an extraordinary woman uh, and her house is, is still there. It was quite amusing to me when I first did a talk about her a few years ago, one of, one of my friends here in Laneham said, oh, my grandma was born in that house. So it's still part of local life. And this house is really remarkable historical evidence of a remarkable life. So she died in 1672, uh, but persecution didn't stop. Uh, we've talked about Endicott. Uh, when he died, the cart and tail law was abolished, but the whipping of Quakers continued in Massachusetts until 1677. Um, although they did make some progress, and, and famously, of course, you'll know, William Penn uh, was given a charter to set up Pennsylvania, and he, of course, was uh, a Quaker. In England, it was um, still problematic uh, and it took a while for freedom to become established. Although Charles was uh, seemed to be liberal when he first became king, it did not last. And the Quakers suffered with increasing laws. Uh, There's the Quaker Act, which was particularly aimed at them, uh, and the two conventicle acts, which were aimed at most types of non-conformist group. And of course, some of you will know that during that time, Mansfield became known as the Zohar of the Midlands, as a place of refuge for persecuted clergy under, under those acts. 
The reasons why Quakers were most likely to be arrested were often uh, marginal to their, their core beliefs. So, for example, the Church of England imposed tithes on everybody. Quakers, on reason of principle, refused to pay those tithes. Uh, they then refused to pay the fines uh, for not paying the tithes and then ended up in prison. So there was a pretty common root of that uh, and many, many occasions where uh, Quakers' possessions were seized and, and then auctioned off. Although there's a lot of evidence that people didn't like such events uh, and often refused to buy the goods in, in the auction. They were also arrested for preaching in the street and in other places where they were not allowed. Now we have a particularly interesting uh, issue in, in Nottinghamshire that's a little bit controversial, but of course some of you will know that the very august Nottinghamshire Historical Society is named after Dr. Robert Thurrity, but he was also one of the most notable persecutors of Quakers. Uh, he's got a somewhat uh, dark reputation when you look at his, his personal life, aside from his scholarship as, as, as a historian. And the Quakers were very good at keeping record of uh, events. In fact, their governing body is still called the, the Court of Sufferings or something like that today, I think. Uh, and we know, for example, that where, where Thoroton uh, persecuted Quakers like a, a young boy in Farnsfield who could only pay his fine by having his coat, trousers, and a few pence taken off them. So not a good day uh, for Nottingham's famous historian. So there we can see a little bit about how this, uh, this developed. Things improved for the Quakers in 1688 after the end of the Stuart monarchy. Uh, and, and by the 1700s, they were largely, though not entirely, uh, free from persecution. They're just one strand of, of the work that we're, that we're doing. So if you want to know more about Nottinghamshire and Lincolnshire history, we've got a couple of books uh, and we also run a Facebook page that has lots of local stories and occasionally, COVID permitting, uh, do trips and historical walks. And all of those are non-profit. You know, all, anything that we can achieve goes back into the community effort to help the world recognise what a fantastic influence Nottinghamshire has had on the world.